everyone to this public hearing. Uh, this is a public hearing about healthcare transformation and quality, not just at the Parkland Health and Hospital System, but, but in our community and our state in general. Uh, this hearing, uh, as, you, as most of you probably know, uh, is required by a process that we're going through. Uh, Section 1115 of the Medicare and Medicaid Code allow, uh, allows for the federal government, specifically the, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, that's the agency that administers Medicare and Medicaid, uh, allows that agency to issue waivers to states for projects within those states that deviate from, from the pretty stiff rules and regulations uh, of the Medicare and Medicaid process if, in fact, those deviations, that those programs under that waiver uh, will advance the cause of transforming the healthcare system, making it a higher quality, uh, lower cost system. Uh, the state of Texas, we, we are participating with the state, we the Harris County, uh, I'm sorry, Harris County, the Parkland Health and Hospital uh, District, which is the Dallas County Hospital District. We are participating with the state in this waiver process and we're very excited about it. And as part of that process, we're holding this hearing. Uh, we, the, the purpose of this, of this evening is to take input from you guys in the public to help us craft how we put the final touches on shaping this waiver in a way that's going to uniquely uh, suit, fit, and improve uh, the overall public health care system uh, in North Texas, and specifically in our region. Uh, our region is made up of three counties, uh, Dallas County, Kaufman County, and Denton County. And we're very proud to have uh, the partnership with Kaufman and Denton counties around this because you know, regionalizing the healthcare delivery system is extremely uh, important. Uh, 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 poor health and poor health outcomes don't stop at the county borders. Good health and good health outcomes don't stop at the county borders uh, either. So tonight we'd like to hear from you, the public. I would strongly encourage anyone uh, who'd like to provide some input, uh, where do they sign up? Uh, in the lobby here. Yeah, go, go, please go to the lobby and sign up to speak. We, we, we not only uh, want to allow you to speak, but encourage you to speak, because this is a very important part of the process where we take input from you. I'm, I'm very excited about this part of the process because it's really important. If we're going to improve the overall health care outcomes uh, in North Texas, it's really important that the public and the communities uh, take ownership. So uh, before I go any further, let me introduce uh, some folks. I don't know if he's still here, but as, as I was coming in, uh, I saw one of our hosts here at Dallas County. I saw uh, County Commissioner John Wiley Price. Would you stand up, sir? We recognize County Commissioner John Wiley Price. Thank you for not only being here, County Commissioner Price has been a steadfast advocate and supporter of the hospital district and the Department of Health and Hospital System uh, and, and helped help us secure this venue uh, this evening. Uh, I also see in the audience uh, our fearless leader, the chairman of the board of the Department of Health and Hospital System, Debbie Branson. Hi, Deb. Wave. <laughs> and our other fearless leader, our, our, C, our interim CEO of, of the hospital system, hospital, the uh, Department of Health and Hospital System, Bob Smith. Hey, Bob. Now, are there any officials from uh, Kaufman County or Denton County here that I don't recognize because I don't want, I don't want to slight or miss anybody? Great. So it looks like everybody here is supposed to be here. Right, so uh, uh, this 1115 uh, waiver process actually started uh, a few years ago. This is, this is not something new. And uh, one, of, one of the people who's, who's, who's not only uh, driven this process and helped guide this process, but it been intimately involved in helping us put together as strong a waiver application as possible, uh, is Margaret Jordan. Margaret is president and CEO of, of DMR, the Dallas Medical Resources. Uh, which is a community group uh, supported by the business community and folks in the community that, 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 that whose whole mission, whose whole mission it is to help better coordinate uh, and advocate for better coordinated health care uh, in, in North Texas and in our general community. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Margaret Jordan. Margaret is somebody I actually met year back in 1996 or 7 uh, when she was when she was with Texas Health, uh, she was with Texas Health Resources. Uh, uh, and she, you know, she has a stellar history uh, with with with, uh, Kai, with uh, Kai, Kaiser, uh, which is obviously one of the stalwart uh, health health entities in this nation over the last few decades. And before that, a long history in healthcare healthcare administration. So, without further ado, to talk about 
to give us a general overview of, of, of the waiver, its history, its function, and all that, uh, Ms. Margaret Jordan. Uh, I say welcome to all of you, and thanks for coming this evening to hear about um, our plan for the Regional Healthcare Partnership 9. Um, as I'm going to be a little redundant, um, and for the record, uh, in December of this past year, 2011, uh, the Texas Health and Human Services Commission received approval for this program as under the waiver that uh, Eddie has mentioned, the Texas Healthcare Transformation and Quality Improvement Program. And I'd like to say that again, the Texas Healthcare Transformation and Quality Improvement Program. It is a very different program than any program that Texas has had before uh, under the Medicaid program. It was put in place uh, when Texas decided to expand the Medicaid managed care and it, and it needed to preserve some federal supplemental funding from, from the Medicaid program that had previously been gotten under the upper payment limit program. I will not explain that to you tonight. Um, <laughs> you. And, um, but essentially this program establishes two funds that will bring in supplemental money. It establishes the uncompensated care pool and it establishes the delivery system reform and incentive payment pool. Delivery system reform and incentive payment pool. The DISREP pool. Um, the DISREP, the uncompensated care pool payments are designed to help offset the cost of uncompensated care provided by hospitals and other health care providers uh, in across the state. The DISREP pool, or the delivery system reform and incentive payment pool, uh, are incentive payments to hospitals and other health care providers that develop programs or strategies to enhance access to care, increase the quality of care, improve the cost effectiveness of care, and benefit the health of the patients and the families served. These are the transformative projects that are, that are going to be included, that are included in our plan. Um, the Health and Human Services Commission at the State of Texas defined the types of people who are eligible to participate in this transformation waiver, and they included hospitals, community mental health centers, local health departments, physician practice plans affiliated with academic health centers, and physician practice plans not affiliated with an academic health center. And to receive payments from either the uncompensated care pool or the disrupt pool, Entities have to participate in a regional health care partnership. So the state established 20 regions in the state, and you've heard mentioned that ours is Region 9, is comprised of Kaufman, Denton, and Dallas County. And each of these regional health care partner uh, regions were to develop a regional health care partnership made up of the types of participating providers who are involved with this plan. Uh, Region 9 has been working now for over a year and we have had 100 plus people involved in developing this plan, 40 plus agencies involved in this plan. Uh, right. Now, Dallas County Hospital District, or Parkland, has a very specific role in this plan. There are a number of roles in this plan. And they, in fact, they have three roles in this plan. One is the anchor role, which is the administrative role for it putting together this partnership, coordinating and developing this plan, overseeing its development, submitting it uh, in electronic form to the state, and eventually tracking uh, the projects and their milestones and, uh, and their successes and reporting to the state. It's a major role, a large staff role for Parkland. The second function that Parkland has is as a participating provider in the plan. So they would have disrupt projects in the plan and they will receive uncompensated care. And the third really major role is that they are the transfer of funds, the, the intergovernmental transfer funds that for the, on behalf of the state that go to the federal government and bring back the dollars. So there are three roles. Tonight, Parkland is playing in this role, the administrative role is the anchor. Uh, now the plan, the plan as I mentioned to you, uh, is probably in excess of 1,700 pages uh, and is in a format that was dictated by the state. Uh, it's fairly complex, very, very, very specific because the federal government is going to be paying, as I said, uh, the uncompensated care, the uncompensated care pool, their share, and in these projects based on what's in that plan. So tonight you're going to be hearing more about the plan. 
One of the important parts of the plan is a community needs assessment. All the projects have to be tied back to needs that have been identified in this region, and Dr. Summer Collins is going to tell you about that, and I'm introduce you to her in a minute. Uh, then in addition, all the participating providers have developed projects and plans for that go into the plan. You'll hear, be hearing more about that from Ted Shaw. Uh, but I just want to emphasize that this is a very complex plan, and it has involved hours of work by the people who have been involved in developing this plan. Uh, Dr. Summer Collins is the Director of Population and Public Health Research at the uh, Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council, and she led a group, a very representative group, in developing what the community needs are for this, for this area. Uh, and uh, she is going to proceed to tell us about that, and I will be happy to answer more questions if you want to know more about this very complex program. So, Thank you. Thank you everyone and thank you for the opportunity tonight to share with you a little bit about our process related to the Community Health Needs Assessment Task Force and some of the findings that we identified as a group. So we began uh, the Community Health Needs Assessment Task Force, as Margaret mentioned, many, many organizations have contributed to the waiver process overall and then within our work group we had over uh, 25 organizations participate and help us um, come up with the information needed to understand the quality of, of healthcare and, and community health in our area. So we began, um, we began our work in February of 2012 and periodically met with the committee uh, through the end of April, at which time we presented a draft report of our findings and what that information means uh, uh, to our community. So we were lucky and, and very, um, to have a strong community, a community health assessment task force composed of individuals with a really strong knowledge and expertise in healthcare and the infrastructure of our region and also with the, the medical expertise and background to help us really deeply dive into the issues that we found. So um, again, what I'll share with you today is just the, the overall findings and then uh, as there is the final 1115 report, we also came up with a community needs assessment report that is available as well. So there was about seven um, key findings that the group identified that I want to go through today. Um, and this was a result of a ranking and prioritization process that the group underwent and um, really felt that it was important to share um, to align the projects and programs proposed out of this waiver with those needs. So the first issue was the capacity of primary care and specialty care. So there are many people in our, our community um, that have access to and have the ability to see great providers, um, but we need more of them. We need more of the providers that help us stay well, including the, the pediatricians, the family practitioners, the internists, and we also need more of the uh, primary uh, the care providers, the specialists that help us in complex situations. For example, the endocrinologists in diabetes care or the cardiologists in the heart in the heart conditions. We, we need more of that in our, in our community. We recognize that that is an area that is lacking. Um, and we, the data suggests that not only is there a, a volume um, and that we need more, but we also need um, healthcare providers that have flexible hours that are available to see community um, uh, patients and community members on, on days and um, weekend hours that meet the, the true polite nature of our lives. And so that's another area um, that we recognized and identified as a community. So that was important. Um, behavioral health also surfaced as another big issue. And behavioral health is really defined as um, mental health and substance use issues. And there are many, many people who um, live in our communities, and in the Korea counties mentioned, um, that, that need those services and that come to our hospitals and to our healthcare providers for assistance related to those issues. So it's really important that, um, that we have the capacity to, to see everyone. And, and for some, that's the primary reason for the visit. And for others, it's a reason along with other things going on. And we've recognized as a, as a task force that the, the way that those present themselves in, um, in either instance, you know, the human resources and the financial resources are very intense. And our healthcare system uh, really needs to um, grow to address those circumstances where behavioral health is an issue. Um, so that's an opportunity that we have to redesign our, our healthcare system and create a a place where patients are, are better and more effectively served in that way. Um, chronic disease was the third category that arose as a finding of the Community Needs Assessment Task Force. And chronic diseases are really uh, categorized as diseases that are slow in um, progression but long in duration. 
So it's not the, necessarily the reason that um, an emergency room department visit would occur, but the reason why, you know, over time you have the, the diabetic complications, the asthmatic complications. And so, um, as you know, these, these can affect the quality of life and productivity of all of us, and so we want to try to keep those from progressing. And unfortunately, that's growing in our community. We're seeing more and more adults with chronic disease and children, as well as the onset of those conditions being earlier and earlier in life. And so we want to try to address that and get in front of that so um, you know, we, we don't have another generation with uh, complications from these chronic diseases experiencing that earlier and earlier in life. So that is another um, category that the Needs Assessment Task Force identified as an opportunity to be addressed by these um, waiver programs. The fourth category was uh, patient safety and quality. So when we all go to the hospital, and we're in a healthcare setting for that matter, um, there's an issue, there's a reason why we're there. We want to make sure that that's the reason that we're um, being treated and that we're taking care of that. We, we really don't want any complexity added by an uh, infection or an injury that occurs in a hospital or healthcare setting. Um, in our area, we uh, reviewed the data and it demonstrated that we're doing actually quite well regionally related to patient safety and quality. Those instances of um, falls or infections or surgical complications that happen once you're already in the hospital um, are, are fairly low, but we want to get that even lower to a, to a zero, to a point where we're not um, seeing that at all. And so that's something that we also measured as a community health uh, um, task force and looked at that information and have that data benchmark now for moving forward as we hope to improve over time through this data program. Um, another major category of assessments was the emergency department use and the readmission patterns that we're seeing as a region. Um, the emergency departments are designed for those instances of care that are very acute, that are very intense, that are very serious. Um, but what our data uh, and our review indicated was that many times um, the, the most common reasons that people uh, go to the emergency room are for those that are more um, non-emergent, perhaps chronic pain, you know, low back pain, bronchitis, hypertension, things that are very important and, and obviously very uncomfortable, but things that perhaps can we think about different ways that we as a healthcare community can help drive that um, to a setting where there's more uh, primary care resources and opportunity to really talk through those conditions with people rather than an urgent care setting um, that has a, a high cost associated with, with as well. So um, it's a challenging environment for patients, it's a costlier environment for the healthcare providers, and we want to see if through this um, there can be an alignment to more preventative um, methods of treating those chronic conditions. And we, we certainly don't want to see individuals, and, and I know as a patient, I personally don't want to be treated and, and then have to go back the next day or the next week and the next month. And so those readmissions are something that we really want to monitor and, and see um, a change in. We have obviously um, a lot of great providers and a lot of great resources in our community. And I think that as it relates to emergency department readmissions, that's an area that um, we really have an opportunity to address. There were two more issues that arose from the task force that I just wanted to briefly touch on, and that was palliative care. So um, the data indicates that the last two years of life um, are actually the... Hey, someone, would you define for us what palliative care is? Absolutely. But I came on this board, I had never heard of it. Absolutely. I, I, that's important. And so palliative care is the, um, the care that is received uh, for the patient's comfort and for the quality of life. Um, and so that... And they're in the last years of life. Yes, it, 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 it most commonly is. Yeah, in the last stage of disease. And, and unfortunately, in those last stages, that's when a very high volume of resources are used financially and, and otherwise. And so what can we do about that as a community, knowing that we have a huge network of, of nursing facilities, of long-term care facilities, home health? Um, how can we, as a healthcare community, work together to really impact those those periods of, of, life, of people's lives and um, you know improve that palliative care that, that occurs during that time. The final area that the group assessed was oral health and oral health services. So oral health is just overall connected to health um, in many significant ways. Um, we are noticing, and, and the data indicates that fewer children in Texas and our area are reporting healthy excellent or very good oral health. 
and, and that's an issue, as we know, with kids. They're, you know, they're growing up, they're getting older, so what does that mean for their oral health as adults? And so, um, additionally, as we all may know, and with the construction on the highways, <laughs> we're growing. We're growing as a, as a community, and the, the dentists and the, the individuals providing the dental services are growing at a rate that is slower than the growth of our community overall. So we want to make sure that we look at that, we get in front of that, and we allow for um, you know, excellent dental health. We want, that, we want the number of children who are able to report excellent or very good dental health to increase, and for overall our community to be able to support the, the population's oral health needs. So that um, was, in essence, the seven categories of findings that our Community Health um, Needs Assessment Task Force was able to really dive deep into. We, we were able to utilize a number of um, data resources, um, analytic expertise, and, and have a report that you know, hopefully will guide the work of and align with the projects uh, selected out of this uh, uh, wave of programs. So with that, um, I would like to introduce Ted Shaw, who is the interim. Um, hey, before we do so, so a couple of, first of all, thanks. Oh, yes. well, let, let us, we really, we really know the uh, Dallas Fort Worth Hospital Council a huge, huge uh, Word of thanks for this report. How can people get a copy of it? Absolutely. Or so is it, online? it is online. It is online, and we can make sure that information is provided as to the website address. Um, there is a, a very, it's a very long document. There's an executive summary as well that summarizes things more succinctly. Um, but absolutely, that the report is accessible online, and we do hope that um, it is, you know, utilized. And if there's any questions, absolutely, I would be happy to. And also, in the, let the record show, I'm about to say something positive about the Dallas Morning News. Uh, there was a really good story uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the report that ran in the Dallas Morning News. So if, if, you, if you go on the, the online archive of Morning News about that story, uh, that's, that, that's it. Uh, now, let, let me introduce uh, our interim CFO uh, and, 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 a, and a great, great team member uh, of the Parkland team, uh, Mr. Ted Shaw. Ted, Ted? Came in, Ted, how long have you been here? It's only been three months, oh my gosh. Ted came in three months and we threw him immediately into the deep end. I think literally, first two or three days he was, uh, he, 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 he got there. Uh, we said, okay, now you gotta go down to Austin and start helping us with this waiver. <laughs> and so the waiver that's gonna be billions of dollars in funding for this region for our state and this region over the next, uh, over the next uh, five, five, five years. Uh, and, and, and before 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 I turn to Ted, I do want to introduce a couple. This is a good this is a good segue. Um, this this, uh, this waiver process is an extremely intricate one in a lot of different ways, not the least of which in the public policy setting um, in Austin and and in uh, Washington. Uh, it it's a whole new way of organizing, administering, and, and in fact funding our public health system uh, in the state with the public hospital districts at the center of it. Uh, those public hospital districts exist in Harris County, Dallas County, Tarrant County, Travis County, Bear County, uh, Ector County, is that Midland, right? Uh, El Paso, Lubbock. And, 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 uh, and Lubbock County. Though, and those eight counties essentially form the basis for a mission plan of what's going to transform theoretically and hopefully the entire health care delivery system, public health system uh, in Texas. Uh, health care healthcare policy, to say that health care policy is intricate, involved, and controversial, obviously, uh, is an understatement. Part of the reason why I'm sitting uh, here is I chair the External Affairs Committee of our board. The, that External Affairs Committee kind of has oversight over all of the uh, external touching parts uh, of, of how we do our business uh, at, at Parkland. So that is our you know, media relations, our community relations, our, our legislative and government relations, uh, and, and all of it, and, and even some of our internal, uh, internal relations and communication. I want to, before I turn to Ted, I want to introduce a couple of folks that helped us immensely with that. Our interim senior vice president of the external affairs, Mr. Michael Mays, he's in the back. Uh, uh, we recently uh, did something really smart and promoted one of our longtime uh, team members to a new role at Parkland, a senior, a senior manager of community relations, uh, Ms. Angela uh, Morris. Boy, has she hit the ground running. 
Uh, and our, uh, our newest, one of our newest team members, we stole from the governor's office. Uh, the person who handled all the government with all the health, health and human services policy uh, on, on the governor's staff, uh, our new vice president of government relations, Captain Young. Uh, so welcome to all of you. Uh, and the charge of uh, the charge of all of these people is is we have not done the job we, should, we, we needed to do over the last several years in Parkland in terms of really engaging with all the different publics that are impacted uh, by what we do. Uh, so uh, that's certainly true uh, in the government relations space. We, we are blessed uh, in Dallas County to have, uh, uh, a, a, to have bipartisan support uh, from, our, from, our, from our elected uh, officials in this county. And, and certainly no one has been more stalwart than that. Uh, and frankly, one of the most influential members of the legislature has been the, the state senator in whose district we sit now. And he's here now, so I'd like to welcome and recognize State Senator Royce West. Senator West, thank you so much for coming. He, he, Senator West uh, has, has been a stalwart champion for us, and we, we pledge to do a better job of working with you and your colleagues uh, in, in the legislature because this, this waiver is, is crucially important uh, as we go forward. And so with that, I will now turn to, to give the details uh, and how, so, so how he's going to fix all of this uh, to our interim CFO, uh, Ted Shaw. Ted? Thank you. No question. It's only a few billion dollars. I'm not trying to fix everything, just to fix a few things. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, it's exciting to bring this to Dallas County because we're looking at about a $4 billion program of additional revenue uh, in the Dallas community. Um, that's going to allow us to do a lot of things. One is for those of us that are taking care of uncompensated care, uh, as defined in the, in the regulations, we get paid for doing that. And it's about half of the dollars that are coming in over the next uh, four years. And by the way, we're already finished with the first year of the waiver. The waiver uh, is a five year program. Uh, the first year is basically getting us to where we are today. Uh, and, uh, and in the next four years, or how we're going to plan and implement uh, as we go forward. The, the waiver program, uh, and how does it get funded? Uh, it gets funded by local tax dollars or local intergovernmental transfers um, that are sent from the local areas up to the state and then the state onto the federal government where they get matched and returned to the state. Uh, and that creates these large pools of dollars that allow us to do uh, the, the, the roles that we're uh, are going to do. Um, so one of the roles that Parkland plays, UT Southwestern plays, um, the Dallas County, uh, Denton County, and Kaufman counties play is we provide intergovernmental transfer dollars in order to make that happen. In some states that's done on a statutory or a state level. In, in Texas right now it's done uh, almost uh, substantially from the local level, passing up to the state, and then the state on the federal government. Uh, region 9, uh, as uh, Margaret indicated, is three counties, Dallas, Denton, and Kaufman. So as we look at the, uh, the program, we're trying to transform care in those and across those counties. Uh, the program is uh, rigidly structured. It is not uh, one that uh, just allows us to take money uh, and spend it where we want. Uh, there are very rigid and structured uh, menus of, from which we can choose projects. Uh, I think in, in, in the final essence, the, the menu itself is 400 pages long and very prescriptive uh, on, on what we can do. And one of the other unique things about this district program that's different from some of the other uh, federal or state programs in the past is that these dollars are at risk. Um, you don't, you actually have to perform to earn them. Uh, and so as we look at the project we'll talk about tonight, um, remember that each of the programs, each of these participating providers is at risk to make sure that they're successful in order to earn those dollars. Um, the district program is uh, basically made up of four categories of programs. The first two, uh, one is called category one, is the infrastructure development. Uh, we're building things that help us deliver and improve transform care. Uh, category two are those programs or projects that will actually transform care, work interactively, do the uh, types of things for innovation and redesign. Uh, and then they came along with uh, category three. And what's important about category three is it is designed a program 
everything that's a project in category one and category two is tied to an outcome in category three. So unless you can tie it to one of those outcomes, and again, they're very prescriptive, um, you don't get to have a valid project. So we've all been uh, over 75 people working on these, these groups and been working to make sure that they're tied to those programs. And then category uh, four is a reporting uh, category. We're all participating providers, uh, uh, participating in reporting certain information uh, to the federal government on how we're doing on standardized measurements. Uh, and then we get paid for that reporting as well. Uh, the, the, uh, the, probably the most difficult thing is, as we've gone through this process is to try to create projects that meet that menu and they can be tied to clinical outcomes. And uh, it's very difficult in terms of how it's defined, but uh, uh, we believe we've now, uh, working with, with the groups, identified 95 projects uh, for Dallas County. Dallas Denton and Region 9. Tim, could you, sure. uh, would you want to just mention real quick, how many, what was the universe of projects we started with to review and looking at? Well, um, we, we started with over 125 program projects. Those have been... Well, probably more, at the very beginning, more than that. Right. Uh, yeah. right. uh, the, the initial pass after everybody you know, sat down was about 125, 127 programs. And then we found out that the rules changed because the rules changed significantly between August and now uh, in terms of how what would fit and what wouldn't and what would qualify. Uh, and so everybody has worked together to get us to, uh, to where we are tonight. And tonight what we're doing is really talking about and, and, and these 95 projects are past form projects. So here's another complexity to the rules. The rules say uh, only certain people are eligible to participate in PASS-1. Those are all the safety net hospitals and a few other prime uh, entities. Um, and then it further breaks down the available dollars to some other categories. So there's dollars that are available for healthcare providers participating in hospitals. There's also dollars that are carved out uh, for academic medical programs. Uh, and then there's uh, dollars that are carved out for uh, uh, mental health. Uh, and so we're working in all of those areas to try to uh, bring across dollars and projects in each of those areas. You were uh, provided if you, as you came in or if you didn't get it, uh, it was available. There's uh, about a four-page document that, first of all, lists the projects in the past one uh, by or, or, or summarizes them by performing provider. Uh, and you'll see that that uh, totals about uh, 1. Uh, 1 million, $1.1 billion over the next uh, uh, four years from EDY5. Uh, when you actually uh, add to that the past two and past three dollars, it will uh, eventually get up to about two million dollars. So uh, behind that, uh, that first page, which breaks the dollars down, you'll see the individual hospitals or participating providers, uh, and then you'll also see the project broken out by provider. And that gives you a sense of the, the 95 projects that are listed there and, and who will be performing or leading those projects. Many of the projects are common projects and there'll be people working on some of the participating projects, working together to help build networks or improve things. Uh, and I'll summarize that in a minute. Um, and then I believe on page five, and we'll just continue. Uh, the other indication that you should see there is uh, uh, they're grouped by a number on the left hand side, beginning on page four of it. Uh, it starts with the district number, that's a definitive number in the, uh, the, the menu. Uh, it starts 1.1, for example, and that has to do with expansion of primary care. It continues on uh, through the various menu choices for 2.9. Uh, and uh, which is that that would be the ones that expanded the patient navigation center. Uh, and again, those 95 projects um, are in the process of being finalized as we speak. They will be, I uh, hope, next Wednesday published on our website or uh, Region 9 website. And I'll give you that uh, web um, address in just a moment. It's also where you can get the uh, community needs assessment. Um, the, uh, just to give you a little bit of the timing, um, we will complete, based after tonight, with your input, we'll complete the 
task one approach. We'll file that uh, on November the 16th and immediately begin then working on what's task two. So there'll be some additional projects that will be identified in task two um, and, and those will be additional, some additional providers and some additional uh, projects like some of the existing uh, participating providers. Uh, that uh, then has to be finalized and filed uh, by the December 31st, uh, and that will be the final or, or, or ultimate project uh, as we file that with the state. So far, last week or the October 31st, we filed our, our first uh, part of the plan, and that is the introductory and executive overview, although it's not uh, it'll be further um, dressed out as we complete the duties. It included the, uh, the needs assessment. Uh, and then it, it met all the, and we did that because that was required to meet all the CMS guidelines to have a filing on, on, uh, on it before the deadline of, this, of October 31st. Uh, the CMS, uh, because they spent quite a time uh, regarding changes in rules and, and negotiations with the, uh, the, Health, the Health and Human Services Commission, um, took about an extra two months to get their final rules and regs done so that the original deadline of October 31st has now been extended to December 31st. And so we'll be filing in conjunction with that. Uh, when that gets done, uh, the filing is sent off uh, to Austin. Austin does uh, a review uh, and then Austin sends it on to Washington. And Washington then will give the final blessing to whether or not those uh, projects and plans will be approved. And so it'll be sometime probably in the late spring, March or early April before any of us really know whether our projects or our plans are approved. Uh, but that's, uh, that's not stopping because most of us know that we have to start now in order to get uh, where we need to be uh, for um, the uh, uh, earned money in, in, in DY, what's called DY2. Um, I'm sure that I, well, I wanted to talk about the, the categorization of the, the projects. Uh, of, of 95 projects, 12 are uh, projects that deal with the expansion of primary care. Uh, we have uh, 13 projects that deal with uh, helping pa uh, patients through with what we call care navigation and care transitions. In other words, and get the patients taken care of through the continuum so that they don't get lost. Uh, we have another 12 projects that deal with chronic disease management, 11 projects that deal with expanding behavioral health options and, and, and alternatives, uh, one of which I want to comment on in, in, uh, here in Dallas County uh, because of some of the complexities of the rules, we couldn't do about five different projects, so uh, the Dallas County Health Department uh, uh, came together and worked to create one large project, uh, which they're funding uh, with their own IDT, which is really, uh, I think, just indicative of the fact that they worked hard to make this happen. Um, we have uh, eight um, projects in the medical home area, uh, expansion of medical homes, increasing those. Uh, we have uh, another uh, seven projects for integrating primary health care and behavioral health, another major need. In, in terms of the, the people with behavioral issues also have often have medical issues and how we're going to coordinate and treat with those. And then four other projects in, in really dealing with telehealth and, and how we can improve through technology in terms of sharing healthcare information. Uh, additional projects will be identified for uh, the CAS uh, 2. Um, for those of you that are, are interested in seeing the detail, uh, uh, please about next Tuesday or Wednesday, it'll be posted on the following website. And I don't know if this is on a handout, uh, but if not, we'll make sure that it's uh, made available. But it's http colon forward slash forward slash www.parklandhospital.com forward slash section dash 1115 dash Medicaid dash waiver dot HTML. Who came up with that? What happened after the states? Yeah, okay. It's, it's probably prescriptive. Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of stuff the state makes you do. All right. So. <laughs>
Is it on there? Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, it's at the bottom of this slide. If you look on the, the second page down here, uh, on the back of the, of the cover. I'm sorry, the back of it, yeah. Um, it's listed the small print for those of you who can read it, you may have my glasses. So. Uh, but that is where the 1115 waiver is at this point. Where we're moving forward. We intend to have our, uh, again, our first uh, a completed pass done by the, uh, the middle of next week and ready to be filed on or before the 15th of uh, November. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Now it's time for us to hear uh, to hear from from you guys again. We encourage you. Please give us please give us uh, your input. This is this is your chance to have a real impact on how we shape how we shape uh, this plan and how it, and how it goes in. Uh, you know, uh, in an earlier part of my life, I, I had the the, uh, the the great uh, honor and pleasure of uh, working on Capitol Hill for a senior member of the Ways and Means Committee by the name of Jake Pickle uh, from Austin. Uh, this was during the Clinton Healthcare Awards, when we were doing healthcare policy. That was my first deep dive into healthcare policy. I remember one night, in the dead of night, about three in the morning, we were working on the healthcare uh, legislation, which was you know, several hundred pages. And uh, a member, I won't say from where, but from a you know, large uh, southwestern state that likes Longhorns, um, but a member of that committee was able to change a word, shall, to may. And that one change in one line of that bill was going to bring an additional fifty million dollars on the table. That's how. That's <laughs> and Senator West and, 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 and Commissioner Price can tell you that's sometimes how these things uh, work. And so it's really, really important that we understand what we want very clearly and build it in, and then watch it, uh, and, and then watch, and then and, and then watch everything very closely. Uh, as Ted said, there's been already been a lot of dips and dives and changes. The good news is there's more clarity now. Some things have happened. Uh, uh, a few months ago, uh, there was a transition in leadership at the State Health Department, the Health and Human Services Commission, and the new head of the Health and Human Services Commission, uh, former Senator uh, Kyle Janik, who's now Commissioner uh, Janik, who, whom Senator Royce knows very well and worked very closely with, uh, ha has brought stable new leadership. Uh, to the commission. That in and of itself has already cleared uh, a lot of the web, getting, getting, getting a lot of this stuff uh, finalized. Uh, likewise, there, there, there was an event that happened in the last 24 hours uh, that clarified a lot of healthcare policy in this nation, or, or at least gave us a path to more clarity. Uh, uh, quite frankly, the part, part of us been holding some, some of the decision making up nationwide on a lot of this stuff is people weren't clear what was going to happen in the election. Uh, just the fact that we have more clarity now. I think puts us in a better place to move this stuff forward. So did, I say all that to say this. Your input, this, this is window dressing. This is your chance to have real input that will have a real impact. So please step forward. So we've got people, some, a few people signed up already, and I, I'm probably going to butcher your names. I apologize. Uh, we have uh, Michael, is it Darazet? Darazet. Huh? Darazet, uh, the CEO, the executive vice president, the CEO of the Dallas County Medical Society. Uh, would you come forward, sir? Dr. Snyder is going to speak. Dr. Snyder, the president of the Dallas County Medical mm -hmm. Society, is he going to speak in your state or just first? In my state. Uh, Dr. Rick Snyder is president of the Dallas County Medical Society. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you very much, and I apologize for my attire. I just came from the hospital. Uh, Doc, doctors, are, doctors are free to dress like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I went into the profession, too. Uh, my name is Rick Snyder, and I am president of the Dallas County Medical Society. On behalf of the DCMS Board of Directors, I stand before you to applaud the efforts of Parkland Health and Hospital System in their critical role as the Anchor Hospital and Dallas Medical Resource for facilitating the creation of the plan for Region 9. Throughout the last eight or nine months, the Medical Society has been invited to be an active participant in the process. We've attempted to build a regional district program with physicians and private hospitals to address the needs of the uninsured. Much of this work has been done outside of Parkland's responsibility, and in spite of the best efforts of the Medical Society, we've been informed just this morning that significant and serious changes have been made to our regional program known as My Medical Home by the private hospitals. These changes threaten the ability of our medical society to partner with the area of private hospitals. 
We expect to work closely with the system CEOs in the coming 24 to 72 hour period to resolve these issues prior to Parkland's release of the Region 9 plan. Thank you once again to Parkland and DMR for your leadership. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Snyder. And we look forward to uh, the outcomes of your discussions with the, uh, with the, the uh, private hospitals. Uh, next, I, I, I apologize, I can't read the visit. Look, Jessica, is Jessica here? I can't read your last name. Eddie, that name was scratched out. She was not one I talked to. Okay, okay. Well, we've got time. We still have time. Any, anybody else want to come forward? <coughs> well, well, before we close the hearing, I would ask you. Uh, yeah, please do. Uh, first, many of the people here are participants and participating in the plan. And I'd like to just so that you know it. Have you stand up, those of you who've been involved with the development of this plan, to just stand up so everybody else can rec understand and recognize you? Please. Yeah. <laughs> four hours, at least, at least one meeting a week, frequent phone calls, and lots of other things. And so I just can't tell you how much time and effort we've gone to develop this plan. So I want to thank all of you. Too. Well, I would be remiss part of those hearing. Uh, if I didn't ask my chairwoman if she wanted it, if she had any remarks she wanted to make. I know. Thank you, Dad. All right. Uh, I'm going to put them on the spot because I didn't tell them I was going to do this, but I would, I would ask at this point, uh, ask our elected officials to come forward and just give us whatever thoughts they have. Senator West, do you have any thoughts you'd like to, to share with us in, in advance of this nice, peaceful session you're about to have? No issues and no money problems and no education problems. All easy. <laughs> First of all, let me say that I'm good and you're ditto, 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 and you're right about all of it. Uh, <laughs> i tell you what, uh, I've had a uh, second. First of all, good evening to each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, chairperson, and Rick, thanks to you all. Uh, when, when you think about what you guys have done, uh, Mark and Joe and I want to say thank you for everything you know, you know, the, the reality is, is that I've had, had a staff person Kind of in some of the meetings that I had going on, that has kept me up on exactly what you're doing. Um, know that after you finish this process and it goes to the state, make certain that you continue to use our office as a resource to deal with any issues that come on because this is very, this way the process is very important. And I serve on the Health and Service Committee, and need to say we also have a special committee uh, dealing with the 1115 waivers. I am very interested in what we're doing here in Region 9 as it relates to the waiver, making certain that we utilize the dollars effectively. So I applaud you for what you've done. I applaud you for bringing together the community in order to uh, make certain that what we have is a stakeholder driven process. So, Ms. thank you. Thank you so much for your service. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sure. Senator West doesn't wait for us to call him. He calls us and says, What do you all need? What are you doing? Uh, and then finally, I want to. Uh, 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 Asked to step and have confidence. Our host uh, uh, from the Commission's Court, uh, uh, Commissioner John Wilder Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to all of you who are assembled, thank you so much for this meeting. Very pleased to, to host you tonight. But more than anything, I, I want all the participants here, but I also want to thank uh, Kaufman and Ed. Uh, as we look at those 20 regions around the, uh, around the state, uh, I want to thank them for, for joining me with uh, Dallas County. We serve a mutual kind of constituency, uh, and given the <clears throat> politics sometime of the day, uh, that, that, that was their bold move for the right move. So we don't just sit here tonight, even though know, we didn't see any other stand to be represented. They are definitely represented and working in conjunction with uh, not only this region, uh, the hospital council, with all of us. And so I just want to stand tonight and thank them for being a part. It is so many, so many people in this community that owe Parkland, this, this whole health system region I, such a debt of gratitude. I stand tonight for those individuals who haven't had the opportunity to say thank you uh, to you 
for all that you've done. And so in the, in the final analysis, uh, we're, we're going to continue to move forward. Thank you for, for your leadership. So, thank you. Thank you. And with that, if, if there's no one else who has a question or comment, we'll close the hearing. Thank you all so much for coming.